these law firms, they exert huge sway and I think often kind of corrosive sway in court, but a lot more of it is actually taking place behind the scenes in Washington and in state capitals and, and also just in normal small towns all over the country, more or less on a daily basis. I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. Capitalism is based on the pursuit of self-interest. One of the fundamental questions is how unrestrained this pursuit should be. Milton Friedman famously said that the only responsibility of firms is to, quote, make as much money as possible while conforming to their basic rules of society, both those embodied in law and those embodied in ethical custom. Hmm. Who decides what is legal? Ultimately, it is the judicial system. But in the day-to-day operation, Businesses have to make many decisions. If the speed limit is 55, is it okay to drive 60 or 65? Also, imagine there is a magic lawyer who can ensure that the firm is acquitted for any possible charge. Should a firm ignore the law and hire that magic lawyer? There are very powerful law firms that through either sheer brilliance, scorched earth strategies, high level contacts from what we all know as the revolving door are very effective in protecting firms. More importantly, should law firms who are themselves businesses these days apply those techniques? And if so, how aggressively should they be applied? To try and answer these difficult questions, this week we invited to the show David Enrich, New York Times journalist and author of Servants of the Dan, Giant Law Firms, Donald Trump, and the Corruption of Justice. As we mentioned a few weeks ago, we're interested in analyzing the role enablers play in distorting the capitalist system. In February, we analyzed the business of consultants, and last month, the scientists for sale. In this episode, we're focusing on the lawyer market. Andrew's book, provides a very interesting history of the emergence of a giant law firm through the lenses of the history of one of the major ones, John's Day. One of the important parts of the book and where it has gotten a lot of attention is its focus on the involvement of Jones Day with with the Trump administration. We're actually more interested in Jones Day's involvement in the defense of some of the most troubled and controversial corporations in America, from Purdue Pharma to RJR Nabisco, from gun makers to Abbott accused of of producing infected baby formula. In a key paragraph, David writes this, The work of elite lawyers and law firms has less and less to do with courtroom representation. Instead, it is geared toward helping clients sidestep regulations, control the media, whitewash their reputations, dodge taxes, and hide their money. Tasks that don't even fit under the most expansive definition of work to which clients are constitutionally or ethically entitled. Wow. (laughs) Finally, the other day, I was reading a book about Wirecard, which is the biggest financial fraud since Madoff. And uh, surprise, surprise, what law firm was defending it? John Stay. The theme of David's book, or one of the themes of his book, is what led to the transformation of professional firms into cynical businesses was the increase in competition and size that took place starting in the late 1970s. Ironically, the book attributes a major role in this evolution to a monthly magazine called The American Lawyer, which debuted in uh, 1979. The American lawyer's mission was to reveal the industry like other outlets did Hollywood or the NBA, titillating the ego of every major lawyer and foster a spiraling of their compensation. In fact, in a recent paper, I documented that the average income per partner of the top 100 law firms went from 600,000 to more than 2 million in 2020 dollar during this period. So is more than triple in real terms. I think the issue might be more complicated than the rise of the American lawyer, but let's discuss it all with David. 
One of the insights that I absolutely loved in your book was this idea that we've conflated an individual's right to a vigorous defense with a corporation's right to, to a vigorous defense. And I love that insight because it actually, I took that conflation for granted. It actually never occurred to me that it was a false conflation. So do you remember when that idea occurred to you that, that, that wow, we've, we've, we've done this? And then how would you chart the history of that? And where do you place that in the pantheon of, of what's gone wrong? Yeah, I do remember when this occurred to me. At the beginning of a project like this, Bethany, I know you know this from your own reporting experience, like you start out just trying to contact anyone you can who either currently or previously worked at the organization. And pretty early on, I found people who were willing to kind of talk openly, but I also found a lot of people who were just kind of offended, I think, by the very notion of digging into what law firms do or holding law firms or lawyers to account for their representation on behalf of clients. And so I just started talking to people not in at law firms but elsewhere in the legal profession and trying to kind of get my brain around this they kind of helped me understand that a it's not as you just said it's not the same individuals in under the bill of rights have a you know when charged with a crime have the unquestioned right to a zealous and competent legal defense corporations aren't mentioned anywhere but even if you accept that corporations are people under the US constitution which is questionable the Constitution only entitles you to a zealous, competent representation when you're charged with a crime. And the vast majority of services that lawyers and law firms are providing to big companies these days do not involve criminal defense work. They are on either civil cases or more than that on you know, working to help companies minimize their taxes, whether that legally or illegally, to skirt or work within government regulations, to lobby the government, to water down regulations or enforce rules differently. Things like that. And th those are services that, while it's understandable that people and companies want to receive those services, and every there's nothing inherently wrong with providing those services, it's not something that you can cloak yourself with these constitutional protections or constitutional kind of rhetoric about everyone deserving a right to counsel. And when that dawned on me, it really changed the way I viewed this book and the legal industry in general, because it became much more about lawyers and law firms making a series of subjective decisions about what kind of services they want to provide, what kind of work they want to do, and for which types of clients. And at that point, it became much clearer that this is really all about the money for a lot of these firms. And it's not about this principle, we're going to stand about, we're going to accept whatever client walks in the door. No, they're actually out there actively soliciting clients, pitching them on aggressive, cutting-edge legal services and legal strategies that often bump right up against kind of the ethical lines that the industry is supposed to adhere to. And it really has nothing to do about serving people or even institutions that are under great duress as the government tries to prosecute them for actual crimes. It has nothing to do with that. I'm a business professor, so I read everything in a particular lens. But my reading of your book is that competition uh, to make more money corrupted the ethics of lawyers and that John's Day is one of the worst in this dimension. But then I went and looked at the famous uh, American Lawyer magazine, and uh, John's Day is only 71st on the list of uh, the most profitable uh, uh, law firm in terms of profit per partner. So I'm a little bit at the puzzle here, and it says, are they so much worse than everybody else? If so, and it, says, it doesn't seem to pay off to be worse. So try to help me out reconcile these elements here. I don't think they are the worst. I think they are kind of in the middle, actually. I think that part of the reason I picked them as a narrative vehicle for this book is that their arc from this kind of random, obscure Midwestern law firm based in Cleveland into one of the biggest law firms in the world, at least in terms of the number of lawyers they have, is that it really exemplifies a lot of the shifts that have taken a place taken place across the industry. But you're right. They are not, if you look at it by profits per partner, they are way down on the list. They're average partners are not making well into the millions of dollars the way a Wachtell partner or a Sullivan and Cromwell or a Skadden or a Cravath partner might be. I, I do think that that's kind of a random way of measuring it because it doesn't account for, you know, at the top of the food chain at a place like Jones Day, the partners are making many millions of dollars a year, but it is, it's a much bigger place. And so the, the spoils, especially as you get a little bit down the food chain, the spoils are spread across a great many more partners than you would at a smaller firm. 
So there's long been an argument, almost conventional wisdom, that part of what's gone gone wrong in America is the concept of shareholder value. For-profit companies mindlessly focused on shareholder value, but law firms are still private private partnerships. You know, I've, I've heard this often about investment banks, for instance, that, oh, if they hadn't started going public, they'd still be better citizens. Is there anything to the concept of a partnership? Does that Does the partnership structure make it actually more prone to moral compromise than the shareholder value-driven corporation? You know, or is there really no distinction in this day and age? Well, I think there are distinctions. I'm just not sure exactly where you, which way they always break. You know, to be honest, I've done a zillion interviews about this book since it came out last fall, but the, you're the first person to ask me that question. So I haven't actually thought about that. But there's, off the top of my head, I think that there's probably something to it. And I think that the one way to make law firms like Jones Day more avaricious would be for them to be publicly traded companies that were also facing quarterly shareholder calls and pressure from shareholders and things like that. I mean, Jones Day, one of the things that I think distinguishes it not only from public companies, but also from many of its peers, is that so much power is held by the top guy at the law firm, and it is always a guy. That allows you to make very swift, speedy, authoritative decisions. It also means that for everyone else in the partnership, there's a lot. it's a lot less democratic, small d democratic. You know, that cuts both ways. That means that you can take advantage of really swift decision making to enter a new market or to say yes to a certain client or say no to a certain client. It also means that you are held hostage to the whims of and sometimes to the ideology of a single person and the small clique that he surrounds himself with. And I think that, you know, shareholder pressure works both ways, right? I mean, there historically over the past 20 years on Wall Street, it's been a great force for pushing companies to become much more short term profit oriented. But it also there is also kind of countervailing pressures where some investors can at least voice their concerns about ethical things. And this is a whole ESG movement, which you guys are obviously well aware of, and also is very complicated and not uh, the panacea that some people present it as. But none of that pressure, that external pressure exists within the confines of really any law firms. And I think it's complicated. I think it cuts both ways it can, for both. It's a, a good thing and a bad thing. But it's interesting because, of course, there is the choice of clients, but there's also the choice of behavior with the client. And and I spoke with some lawyers and I got a very confusing answers because some of them are adamant that you have to do whatever is legal to defend your client. But then I actually read the a ABA, American Bar Association, sort of a, a ethic code with a client-lawyer relationship. And they do say that you have to defend the lawyer with the zeal in advocacy, blah, 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 blah. But also they say the lawyer's duty to act with reasonable diligence does not require the use of offensive tactics or preclude the treating of all persons, including in the legal process, with courtesy and respect. So uh, this, uh, when I read this, came to mind uh, the pastor of your book about Jones Day defending Abbott and, and really berating the poor victims to some extent uh, because uh, the, the parents of, those, uh, of that daughter that uh, is brain dead, literally, have no fault. And for those of you who are not familiar, the dep depositions are done not in front of the judge. And so the lawyers go wild. The, the cross-examination in front of the judge are much more civilized because the, the lawyers don't want to look like jerks in front of the judge. But the depositions are made in front of also the, the opposing uh, counsel. And they're trying very often to intimidate people who are not very confident. And in this particular case, they brought up some stuff like an affair and a drug incident that happened after the incident and completely unrelated to the incident. So it was a pure kind of meanness or strategic action to protect the client, but I think be beyond what the client relationship recommends. Yeah, it's a winning at all costs mentality that has, you know, really transformed the legal profession, I think. And there there was a time, not in my not when I was alive, but certainly when my parents were alive, lawyers primarily viewed themselves as officers of the court whose job was to present facts accurately to a judge or jury so that they could ascertain or make the best stab at the truth. And it's become this no holds barred, I, I think very ethically challenged profession in part because lawyers have followed this path of zealously representing your clients 
down a pretty slippery slope. The example you mentioned with Abbott Labs, when Jones Day is called in to, to defend the company whose baby formula allegedly poisoned a newborn baby, is I think a good example. There's Jones Day also, like many of its other peers, has represented big tobacco companies and used equally aggressive kind of in, tactics of intimidation and threats to prevent people from filing lawsuits or to encourage them to withdraw lawsuits once they're filed. And you know, one of the arguments that lawyers often make when I start bringing up these examples is, you know, we are obligated to zealously represent our clients to the fullest extent possible within the boundaries of the law and our profession's ethics. And that's all well and good, but our legal system today is predicated on the idea of two opposing sides in court basically being able to, within the legal rules, go to battle with each other armed with facts so that judges and juries can make informed decisions. And that system works when there is some equilibrium between the two sides, when both sides have similar amounts of time and resources to spend on a court fight. That equilibrium is completely gone right now. And so that you, if you're a big company accused of wrongdoing, you hire a firm like Jones Day or many other law firms, and they will go to the ends of the earth to turn up evidence to support you and to engage in tactics that I think would make a lot of people blush. And on the other side, you have lawyers who are simply less well equipped to go up against big law firms. And there's some big plaintiff side law firms that do a very good job in these cases, but there are a lot more, including in these cases uh, that I highlighted with Abbott Labs, where the lawyers are just completely overwhelmed and outmatched by this army of lawyers from Jones Day. And the the end of at the end of the day, what that means is that everyone's notion of justice is it's really just I think it is disappointed because you do not, you cannot achieve justice when you have one side in a legal fight that has infinitely more financial and other resources at their disposal than the other side does. And that, that, that equation always plays out, almost always plays out in favor of big, rich companies at the expense of people who claim to have been grievously harmed by those companies. In the Abbott case, you detail in such a heartbreaking fashion the how the plaintiff's lawyer was completely outgunned by Jones Day. But to what extent does the rise of these very wealthy, very powerful plaintiff's firms help offset that? And I'm thinking of firms like Quinn Emanuel, where the partners actually do better than the partners in, in, in big law firms and are highly incentivized um, to fight it out. Does that only work for big cases where there's a lot of money at stake so it doesn't really address fundamental questions of justice? Or is it at least a little bit of a counterbalance? I, I think it's a little bit of a counterbalance. I just don't think it's a consistent counterbalance. The reality is that very, like on a percentage basis, if you look at the number of cases brought, uh, uh, it's a very small number of cases that are brought by these mega mega plaintiff side firms. And, and it's just, it's, it's, so it's not that much of a balance in the grand scheme of things. The, the other point, though, is that I focus a lot in the book on litigation and court cases, which is really important, and that's what Jones Day, one of their specialties. But so much of what big law firms are doing nowadays has nothing to do with anything going on in, inside a courtroom. It, it's stuff like, and there's another chapter in the book where I detail uh, the actions Jones Day took on behalf of R.J. Reynolds, the tobacco company, to basically pressure a small town in Massachusetts not to enact stricter regulations on the sale of flavored tobacco products. And that had nothing to do with a court fight or anything like that. It was Jones Day writing a threatening letter to this small town that just tied the town in knots out of fear that they might one day be sued. And even though the letter was filled with these kind of baseless legal arguments that experienced lawyers said were garbage, it worked really well because the town had, and the politicians running the town had a very, understandably, had a very limited appetite for pursuing a course of action that risked incurring huge financial damages to their small town. And so it's kind of a representative example of a much broader thing that's going on, which is that these law firms, they exert huge sway and I think often kind of corrosive sway in court, but a lot more of it is actually taking place behind the scenes in Washington and in state capitals and, and also just in normal small towns all over the country, more or less on a daily basis. Actually, for me, on that front, the most horrendous stories were the story of uh, Walmart and the way they basically got away with murder, literally, <laughs> in, uh, because of the connection, at least the way I understood, because of the connection that Jones Day had with the Justice Department. Yeah, that's right. And it's a little hard to get into this without kind of opening up the whole Trump can of worms. But I mean, Jones Day, one of the things it has managed to do in the past 10 or 15 years is really transform itself 
into a law firm that specializes not just in litigation and not just in representing big, powerful companies, but also specializes in election law. And uh, they helped run the Trump campaign in 2016. And when Trump took office, they had a lot of success in bringing some of their senior people inside the White House and elsewhere in the Trump administration. And that played huge dividends, not just to the firm, but also to the firm's clients. And the Walmart case is, provides a very kind of, I think, compelling case study of that. And the Justice Department in, under the Trump administration, the U.S. attorneys in Texas had been investigating their Walmart's role in improperly and illegally distributing OxyContin and other opioids. And basically the conclusion that the Justice Department reached was that this was a criminal enterprise. Walmart knew that it was pres fulfilling prescriptions for doctors who were basically pill mills. It knew that those pills were ending up in people's hands who should not have had it, and it led to deadly overdoses. And the U.S. Attorney's Office in Texas built what the lawyers there thought was a very compelling criminal case against Walmart. And Walmart successfully appealed to Jones Day lawyer. Well, Walmart, first of all, was represented by Jones Day. And Jones Day's lawyers appealed to their very recently departed colleagues who are now in the upper echelons of the Justice Department for help basically neutering this investigation. And it worked. And, you know, that is, first of all, very savvy, effective lawyering on behalf of Walmart which in this case was about to be accused of a crime. But it also is it's the type of behavior that people I spoke with inside the Justice Department at the time, who include both Republicans and Democrats, said it, it really diminished their trust and confidence in the, their ability to administer justice impartially. And it was, to them, a really vivid example of the ways that big companies, through their big law firms, can kind of tilt the scale in their favor and... You know, that case ended up, the, the Trump Justice Department ended up bringing a civil case years later against Walmart, but it was kind of a much paler version of what the lawyers in Texas, the Justice Department lawyers in Texas had hoped to bring. And it was, that was really a testament to Jones Day working the levers of power very effectively on behalf of their client. So I coined a phrase a few years ago, at least I think I coined it, I might not have, but um, the shadow justice system, forget about the shadow banking system, the shadow justice system. And this is, I think what you're talking about is, is part of that, and that's the ways in which all these things that are supposed to be pulled out into the light of day and argued in front of a jury, so there's a public record in the courts and the jury hears it, are now conducted in the shadows. And part of that, of, of course, and I think Judge Judd Rakoff has been pretty vocal on this, is the ways in which big corporations now carve out settlements with, with the Justice Department. And those settlements are cloaked in such heavily lawyered language. And I'm thinking of the financial crisis um, settlements with the banks. Billions of dollars in fines. You can't tell who what happened, who was guilty, who was charged. And I guess my, my question for you is how much, how much do you agree with that idea of the shadow justice system? And what do we do about it? Do we just make everything that happens in the law? Does, should it have to be transparent? Should we get rid of this whole system of private negotiations so that it happens in front of a judge and a jury again? I mean, I definitely agree with the way you're characterizing it. And one of the reasons I got interested in law firms in the first place is that I'd spent many years writing about the banking industry, including during the financial crisis. And uh saw the way the banks through their law firms really manipulated is maybe too strong a word, but came close to manipulating the government and really tying the government in knots and making it, they succeeded in preventing any high ranking individuals from ever being held accountable for what happened during the financial crisis and in the years after the financial crisis as well. I was in London with the Wall Street Journal back in like 2012, 2013 period and was closely following the investigations into LIBOR, uh, which I don't know if anyone remembers anymore, but was this of course. global interest rate that was being manipulated or by banks and by bank traders. One of the kind of real themes that emerged from that, I think, is that banks like UBS and Barclays and uh, some of the big American banks as well were that we had clearly engaged in a, a pattern of illegal conduct. They were just absolutely masterful with because of their lawyers at owning up to limited types of misconduct that resulted in relatively low level traders and managers being you know, put on trial. Whereas even though the culture of these banks was actively encouraging bankers and traders to do this type of manipulative behavior, no one in any sort of executive capacity was ever accused of any wrongdoing. And, and the more I dug into that, Gibson Dunn was representing UBS. And 
the way that they had kind of manipulated the immunity programs in both the US and the European Union just struck me. I mean, it was brilliant. They managed to get UBS credit for cooperating. UBS then got to basically set the parameters of the investigation that the federal, that uh, the Justice Department and the CFTC in the U.S. would conduct. And lo and behold, those investigations, which were run by Gibson Dunn on UBS's behalf, found that there was a lot of low-level misconduct, but that there was not anything that involved high-ranking executives. And as, the more I reported that out, the less plausible that explanation actually became. But it worked, and. It, that to me is a really clear example of the shadow legal system. I mean, that's it's not in the public interest. It's very opaque. It's at the expense of the public that has, a, I think, a right to expect that this type of investigation will be administered impartially and the actual wrongdoers and the people responsible for the wrongdoers will face some sort of accountability. How do, what do you do about that? I don't know. I mean, that's I, I like to think in my like happier moments that journalism is what you do about it. Uh, and you, you know, s sunlight being a good disinfectant. Uh, but, you know, that is, I'm not sure, really uh, an adequate answer. As a business professor, what I would like to have seen a bit more is the changes in the, in the business model of law firms, because you discuss about the impact that advertising brought into competition and the impact that the Lawyers Magazine uh, uh, brought into that. But my understanding, and here I might be wrong, my understanding is that a lot of the source of value for senior partners is the fact that you have a lot of junior associates working their butt off at probably below market rate. And so they take a cut on that compensation. And now why associates come in and willing to slave away up to the make to partner because they plan to make it up later on in life. So this system works well only if you have a very high growth, because if you have high growth, you can increase the number of partners. And so everybody is, is better off. And so it is really the pressure to grow the business constantly because otherwise this Ponzi-like scheme might collapse that forces firms to give up any ability, for example, to choose. Because the same Jones Day is, is beautiful, the story that you bring, uh, that at the time of, of Nixon, managing partner of Jones Day refused to defend Nixon. So uh, there was a time where they could afford to do that. I don't think there, there is the time anymore. Is, is, isn't that the, the case? Well, I, I mean, look, you're definitely on to something about this kind of vicious cycle where the more you grow, the more you hire, the more you need to grow and hire to keep uh, kind of increasing your revenue so that you can afford to recruit more partners and you can have associates working for them. But the only reason associates are going to work is if they're on the partnership track and then you have more partners and your profits per partner are going to go down unless you grow the pie which means you need more clients, which means you need more associates, which means you need, you know, round and round we go. I, I think the place where I maybe start to disagree with you a little bit is that that is in any way exculpatory for in terms of the decisions that law firms and lawyers are making in terms of which not only which clients to accept, but also the types of work they would be willing to do for those clients. You know, the Nixon example is interesting in that Jones Day turned down representation of Nixon. But if you go back even further than that, and Jones Day... There was a time in the past where the type of advice they were providing big, powerful companies was much different than it is today. And that's not just about Jones Day. This is only, I'm only using this example because it's emblematic of what's happened throughout the legal industry. But there's this explosion at a natural gas facility in Cleveland in the mid-1940s that leveled an entire neighborhood. It killed a lot of people, caused huge amounts of damage. And Jones Day was called in to basically assess the gas company's liability for this explosion. And... The explosion took place on a Friday. Jones Day spent the weekend trying to figure research and case law and trying to understand the the company's basically options for what they were going to do. That Sunday, they presented the gas company with some choices, and one of them was you know fight. You can it, you're going to get sued, but you can kind of deflect and protract this and make raise questions about like who is actually responsible. Maybe it's the the company that manufactured the gas tank that exploded. Maybe it's the sewer authorities whose tunnels became conduits for this explosive gas. You can blame the homeowners, on and on and on, just normal tactics. Or you can go another route and just accept liability and make people whole because it's the right thing to do. And Jones Day advised that the company do that. And it, the next day, that Monday morning, so this is three days after the explosion, they took out an ad in the Plain Dealer newspaper 
basically inviting people who had been harmed by this explosion to show up at the gas company's offices the following morning, or that morning, that Monday morning, and they would be compensated on the spot. And so Jones Day set up shop in on the ground floor of this building and processed people's claims right then and there. And I, I forget the number, the amount of money that was dished up, but I think it was over $100 million in today's money. You know, decades, many decades later, that is still viewed in Cleveland as it was a great act of civic duty that Jones Day and this gas company, which still operates in Cleveland today, performed. That's, expen- that's short-term expensive for the gas company. It may be a short-term expensive for Jones Day because they don't rack up the huge legal bills that would be involved with litigating all of these cases. But in the long run, it means that Jones Day has this very fruitful relationship with a client that continues to prosper in its home market. And so I, I think to me that, that it, like the takeaway of that is that you can make decisions at a big and fast growing law firm in the long term interests of your clients and therefore yourself that don't necessarily require, you know, abusing opposing witnesses or conducting secret pressure campaigns against the government. You can do the right thing and advise your clients accordingly. And you know, I, I don't. That, that, that's a story that I tell a lot when I'm talking to lawyers right now, and they look at me as if I have, if I, as if I'm just making it up because it's so inconceivable to them that a law firm would actually offer that type of advice. And I think that that's striking that that's so hard for people working at big law firms today to even imagine. Part of what what you're talking about, and you detail in the book pretty convincingly, the rise of American lawyer and Stephen Brill, and this idea that the amount partners were making became public and became extremely competitive. But isn't all of this, and I'm going to ask this in a sloppy way because it's something I'm mulling over, part of a larger issue in American life that is sort of the loss of a elitism based on professional pride and competence replaced with an elitism based solely on financial achievement and money such that in some ways these big law firms don't really have, have, have a choice. And I'm, 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 I'm saying that loosely, but in the sense that they're fighting for, for talent and for people and what Harvard Law School graduate is going to accept now, you know, making less than a couple million dollars a year because then they can't live in the cities where the other people they view of their caliber are, 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 are living. And so it seems to me that it's part of this larger, this, this larger issue of this replacement of, of the substitution of elitism based on money for, for everything else. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, this is, again, something I've not actually thought of until you just articulated it. But that's really interesting. And I, th- I think a big part of this is the role that law schools play. You arrive at a place like Harvard Law, and from the moment you set foot in the door, you can be the most idealistic person who's committed to a career in public interest law, and you are a condition from the moment you set foot at Harvard Law School, inside Harvard Law School, that the expected and accepted and really rational decision is to pursue a career in big law. And that happens in very explicit ways and also in some subtle other ways. And you're, it's explicit in that you're literally told that by your faculty advisors, that this is the right path to you for you to take. You, in, in slightly subtler ways, it ranges from everything from the fact that all of your peers seem to be heading the same direction to. At Harvard, you have the on-campus recruiting system, the computer system enables you with the single click of a mouse or a button on your phone to submit your resume and your your, tran- call, your transcript grades, things like that, to a slew of corporate law firms. And there is no similar system in place for public interest law firms or even plaintiff side law firms. You add on top of that the fact that a ton of people are entering law school with huge debts, like student loans and things like that. And it is a, it, it's almost economically crazy to make a decision other than to go get your the, your tuition paid back, essentially, by spending at least a couple of years in big law. And once you're go- going down that path, I think it's very hard to get out. You get accustomed to making well into the six figures with the prospects of making well into the seven figures. And it just becomes much harder to change that lifestyle once you are already into the system. So f- first of all, I want to clarify that when I was trying to find the economic model, I wasn't trying to have exculpatory evidence. I was more trying to find the mechanism to see how we can possibly undo it. Because the big question is, uh, now that we are here, what what are the root causes and how we, we fight them? So in, in this spirit, let me, and again, not to deflect from the laws at all, but to try to understand also what else has changed around. Because I think the examples you provide are also examples of different corporations. So the East Ohio Gas was a local company by and large. And so it was very valuable for this company to retain a reputation in the Cleveland area because, as you said, they're still around. And 
it probably had they not done that would not be around at least in in, in Ohio. So I think we moved to a world of nowhere corporations and nowhere lawyers. In the past, the corporation had a location and the lawyers had a town where they grew up and they were returning to. And now we are kind of all mercenary uh, moving around. And so reputation has become much, much more difficult to develop and to have an interest. And to Bethany's point, the old uh, ethical law of the past, uh, and later I will challenge whether they are also ethical, but in Let's assume for a moment that it's true. I think part of the story is that competition eroded the space to be ethical. If you have a privileged position, maybe by birth or by gender or by race, it's much easier to allow some slack. Hicks, a famous economist, was saying that the uh, largest luxury of every monopoly is quiet life. And uh, quiet life means also maybe you indulge in your preferences, including feeling good about yourself. But when there is a cathedral competition, you cannot afford that because, uh, first of all, you say, if I don't do it, somebody else does it. Uh, so it's not like really you feel that you're saving the world. The only effect you have is that you are one rank down in the statistics or in the, comp- in the competition. Everybody looks at, with uh, prestige. That, that's the other point that Bethany was making is that prestige is only based on money. And so you want to have the highest profit per partner or the highest pay partner because that makes you more prestigious. I agree with about 90% of what you just said. And the the parts where it differ is that the law firms themselves make a big thing about being about more than money. And they actually go to great lengths, some of them, including Jones Day, to do things that are not in their direct, not in the direct interest of their bottom line. So Jones Day has a big pro bono program, for example, where they do a lot of work, including on the U.S.-Mexico border, where they represent undocumented migrants who are kind of stuck in the vortex of the U.S. legal system down there. And that's something that not only is not profitable for them, I mean, they spend many millions of dollars a year on this, but it cuts against, and they've become identified very much with not just the Republican Party, but the Trump wing of the Republican Party. And representing undocumented migrants on the U.S.-Mexico border is not in keeping with that image, to put it mildly. And I, I think the reason they're doing that is, you know, maybe it's in part because out of the goodness of their heart. I think that actually probably is part of it. But I think part of it is also from a recruiting standpoint. It allows them to appeal to younger, more idealistic lawyers who, despite the pressure to go with the flow and despite their financial needs and their interest in making a ton of money, also in the back of their minds remain, especially when they're younger, remain kind of idealistic and they want to do something good with their law degree. And so the idea of going to a law firm where that spends a lot of time and money and energy doing things that are actually making the world a better place is appealing. And I I think if you extend that logic a little bit, it suggests that there is more to this than just the financialization of everything. I think the financialization is a big part of it, but it, it suggests to me that there might be space where you create different incentives that fulfill different kind of needs in people's brains that will make it, it will allow you to kind of carve out space as whether you're a law firm or a bank or anything else that can appeal to a certain segment of society, both employees and potential clients that are more interested in it kind of doing good than they are, or sorry, doing well than in doing good, at least in the short term. And and I think in the long term, those tend to, you know, tend to align a little bit better. And, you know, you have in the banking space, you have finan- some financial institutions that place a much higher premium and a higher value on uh, whether it's ESG or just other kind of similar metrics. And it, you have that in higher education sometimes. And I don't really see why you couldn't have that in the legal industry as well. It just takes a little creativity and some good marketing and, it, you know, and some patience, I think. The question for a law firm like Jones Day is how do you, why are you always making decisions that come down inside of the short-term financial interests of the firm? Maybe you should be rethinking your priorities a little. Again, I'm kind of talking in circles because now the more that I say that, the more I, I kind of see what you're saying, Luigi, that that is like, if you do that, then you're losing out to competitors and it makes it harder to recruit more people, which makes it harder to grow and then you get in trouble. So it's complicated. 
Yeah, I worry that the the sort of pro bono work or this highly publicized uh, work that appears not to be about money is just a form of greenwashing, right? It's a it's it's a way of being able to say we're not really about what you think we're about, and it's very carefully balanced and calibrated at the firm level as to what the actual amount of resources are being spent on that. But I wanted to ask a different question, which is the role of the the press. Do we not do a good enough job of covering this because we don't do a good enough job of covering it because no one kind of stepped into the American American lawyers' shoes and did this really aggressive kind of reporting around this? Or do we not do a good enough job of covering it because we're conflicted, because lawyers are sources and we don't want to lose our sources? And before you answer that, just for our readers, I wanted to tell a really quick story. It's on the plaintiff's law side of it, not the big law side. But when I was a very young reporter and I had just signed a contract to write a book about Enron, Milberg Weiss, which people remember Milberg Weiss, the once highly powerful plaintiff's law firm, uh, was representing a lot of the Enron plaintiffs. And they were the people you needed to get in to talk to if you wanted access to former employees and the stories they were telling. And my colleague, Peter Elkind, um, with whom I co-wrote my Enron book, had written a very critical story about Milberg Weiss and Bill Iraq called The King of Pain is Hurting. And I went in to see Bill Iraq and assumed that he sort of knew I was working with Peter. And about halfway through our discussion, you know, getting to know each other, he asked me who I was working with. And I said, Peter, and he, he had me thrown out of the firm. I mean, literally had me thrown out of his offices. And <laughs> <laughs> and, and so Peter That's and I amazing. did not get any help from Milberg Weiss That's incredible. on our book. Story. But the point is, I'm telling that story to say that it, it's real. You pay. You pay for the things you, you write and do in terms of access. So That's 100% <laughs> true. And, and I, I think there are two reasons why journalists have not covered this. Well, one is that there is, we pay, historically pay way too much attention to the notion that we've kind of dispensed with earlier, which is that everyone always deserves a lawyer no matter what. And second, what you just said, Bethany, which, and I, I've lived this too. I mean, I've seen, you know, when I was covering banking and Wall Street for in 15 or 20 years, my best sources, many of them were lawyers. And it is very hard to write negative stories about, about your sources. It's hard. And I, it, I kind of gradually came around to the viewpoint that part of the reason the lawyers wanted to be my sources was not just because they liked me or, you know, liked engaging in the two-way street of gossip. It was that they knew that by cultivating me, it was offered kind of a form of insurance. I can tell you, though, that I, there have been very vivid examples in my career where I've witnessed big law firms really punishing people for and punishing news organizations for writing critical stories. And uh, they cut off access. You know, it's that simple. And that is a real powerful disincentive. And frankly, I've seen this with having written this book. Uh, some of my colleagues at the Times have gotten blacklisted by some of the some of the law firms. I'm, this isn't about John Stay, actually. This is about other law firms that have been mentioned in the book. And we've lost access as a result of me having written something. It's not even my colleagues having written it either. It's just it, it's uh, a very vindictive kind of message. And I, I think it's deliberately designed to deter journalists from writing about law firms in anything resembling an aggressive way. So I think it would be nice to find some solution. No, it's difficult. But I was thinking we, we should try to copy a, a page from uh, the lawyer's uh, review, what is called uh, the American lawyer, and do a rating of the quality of the work and the e e uh, ethic element of the work that law firms do. And this is, uh, we can rate the kind of clients they defend, how they defend them. Uh, some of the information you provide for uh, John's Day, I imagine, can be collected on all the major law firms, including the pro bono work. Uh, but if this pro bono work is just the famous lip lipstick on the pig, then we need to expose that. So instead of having just the profit per partner, also the ethic per partner, of the top 100. We should start a publication like this. I, I, I would subscribe. I, I, really, I wanted you to collaborate, not no, to subscribe. Not to <laughs> uh, but I, you know, to me, there's a more kind a slightly more pointed way of doing this, which is that I think journalists should, when they see big law firms doing really aggressive borderline work for big companies, they should view that as a story and write about it the same way you would write about a scandal in any other industry and stop viewing law firms as kind of peripheral and accessories and start viewing them as the story unto themselves. I mean, these are multi-billion dollar institutions. It's a, it may well be a trillion dollar industry. 
and it, with some of the highest paid people in our economy. And we should start treating it with the same scrutiny we cover Wall Street or that we cover any other industry. And that that was one of my goals in writing this book is that it would kind of help start a conversation about that. And I'm not sure that I've succeeded in that, but I, I really, I think that would make a big difference. I think a lot of lawyers and law firms care greatly about the reputation that they have in the mainstream media. And if people, if journalists start really aggressively covering them, I think that that is a way to really change the dynamic inside some of these places. So you you do cover it in the book, obviously, and we've talked about it, which is the role of big law and the opioid crisis. But that would actually be a great uh, um, series in the Times is to look at just really dig into it with each firm and what they did, not just in the case of Walmart, but with all the other companies, too, in order to in order to prevent it, prevent accountability with opioids. So, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you so much for your time, David. And congratulations on a great book. This was really fun and interesting. Thank you so much for having me. Indeed. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. As a journalist myself, I can tell you how important it is for reporters, especially business reporters, to develop a deeper understanding of the subjects we're covering. The Stigler Center's Journalist in Residence program offers paid training in the fundamentals of economic and business at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. And there are other perks. Learn more and apply now at chicagobooth.edu slash Stigler J-I-R. I'm always fascinated when the lens through which I see things shifts. It's not so much the information as it is the lens. And I've always taken it for granted that corporations are owed the same duty of defense that individuals are without ever pausing to think about it. And David's book forced me to pause and think about that and realize that, no, a corporation is different than an individual. And while an individual charged with a crime is entitled to the most vigorous defense a lawyer can mount, a corporation is is not entitled to the same thing. I do think that with with some exceptions, major law firms are more thoughtful about the reputational risk of taking on really, really potentially damaging clients than maybe Dave, David gives them credit for. But I guess from what I've seen, I would agree with him that once that client is taken on, it, it's a no holds barred kind of kind of game. There are very few tactics that are that are that are disallowed. But also, is reputational cost? It's not because this is the right thing or the ethical thing to do. What actually struck me of the book, Chapman Rose, which was a managing partner of Jones, when Nixon asked and was president at the time, asked uh, whether he will defend him, he said, oh, I want to listen to the tape first. And when Nixon did not allow him to listen to the tape, he said no. He said no to the president of the United States. I think mostly out of principle because you didn't know how things were working out. This would be very costly from a reputational point of view to say no to a president. Uh, he did because he didn't want to do it. He didn't think it was the right thing to do. Yeah, and I think... David's book is really, really powerful in the anecdotes. It's hum hard for me to judge how much that really has changed over, over over time. But I think for sure what is true, what David documents, and what is absolutely true is the pressure in a law firm to bring in business and to produce profits. And whenever there's pressure as intense as it is in the, in those organizations, decisions are made for for reasons that don't that don't have much to do with right and wrong. It does seem that the screening is often is this case winnable rather than should this case be winnable <laughs> and those are those are two separate questions i do think the other part of what he gets at is almost more problematic than the pressure to generate revenues and grow profits per partner. I think that's I, I think that is very real. But I think the other part of it is the growth of this the shadow legal system, right? Where so much gets decided outside of public view. Where lobbying that happens before a case is even brought, certainly before it goes goes to trial, dictates so much of the outcome, where giant settlements are carved out in these deferred prosecution agreements and nobody can even tell from what's public what actually happened and whether a real person did something wrong or, or, or didn't do something wrong. And I guess I'd put in that category the growth of lawyers' relationships with the press, but it seems to me that the law should be transparent and the modern law is is anything but transparent in how it and how it operates given all of this. And I think that's more of a problem than the growth of the than than the pressure for profits. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. 
we really don't have a lot of uh, analysis of law firms like we should, and they seem to be incredibly important in the way day-to-day -day capitalism is, is, is run, because at the end of the day, they're the one who decides whether going at 60 or 65 is the right thing to do, even if the law says 55. And, and there are there are things that happen every single day in subterranean ways. I tried to get to the bottom of it when I wrote a piece about the Sackler family for Vanity Fair, this Purdue Pharma issue where the the U.S. attorney in, I think it was Virginia, wanted to bring more serious charges against Purdue, and I think maybe even wanted to bring them against some of the Sackler family. And after a meeting at the Justice Department, the charges were, were reduced and the Sacklers weren't included. And I might be butchering this a little bit. It might be the severity of the charges rather than the Sacklers being included or not being included, or, or it might be both. But something happened at the Justice Department. And despite my knowledge of people who worked there and the access I had when I wrote when I wrote about the Sackler family for Vanity Fair, I couldn't I couldn't get an answer. Uh, that is cloaked in secrecy as 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 to what happened. And that that troubles me. These major things, these major decisions, they shouldn't be cloaked in secrecy. And if I were to play devil's advocate on that, I would would say that there there are charges that are brought by AUAs and, and U.S. attorneys seeking to make a name for themselves that maybe should be stopped before they get they get a public airing. This is not a one sided story where every case brought by a every case brought by a public servant is well intentioned and um, substantive. And when something derails it, it's because of corruption and the case should have been brought. I don't think it's that one sided. I'm not even sure it's 50 50. But 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 nonetheless, I don't like the lack of transparency um, around how all these decisions get made. I agree. Certainly, everybody makes mistakes, including attorney generals. And sometimes those mistakes are not random, but they're they might be politically motivated. This said, I think it's very important to understand, especially when you drop charges or you don't pursue charges against somebody who looks like uh, should be prosecuted. And, and maybe the Attorney General is right, but if he's right, I don't see the cost of explaining why right. he's right. <laughs> and if he's not right, we want to know why is not right? It is a really interesting broad framing of this issue that the very institution, which is the judi judiciary, the legal the legal system in our country, that is meant to be the most transparent, has become one of the least transparent. And that's happened even as the world has become supposedly awash in information. And it plays into one of my favorite theories, but that which is that the world is awash in information, but not the stuff you really want to know. I think you're absolutely right. This is definitely true for the prosecutors. Also, true for a lot of settlements. One of the, the ideas I had with the co-author many years ago was to tax very heavily every settlement that was secret, because it does impose a cost mm -hmm. to society not revealing what is going on. And think about uh, the case of a pedophile priest in, in the Boston uh, Bishop, that they, they were all individually settled. And so he didn't know the, the information. And while there are clearly incentives for the people involved to settle, it does impose a major negative externality on everybody else, because if you have a pedophile priest, you want to know who is he and uh, how to deal with him. And uh, the same is true with criminals or, yeah. or bad practices like the, the opioids. Yeah, it's really interesting, actually, when you look at all the settlements that got crafted and crafted, I think is the right word, between big banks and the Justice Department in the wake of the financial crisis. I wonder if you had given banks two numbers, what the de delta would have been. In other words, OK, what's the price you'll pay if all of this stays secret and we all agree on the language that gets put out into this very elaborately crafted thing that no one who reads it can tell what possibly happened? And what's the price you, you'll you'll pay if, ev what, if every single thing is public, all of our deliberations? all of our conversations, all of our all, all, all of our documents. And I wonder how much of what the banks pay is a payment for secrecy. And that's depressing, right? I mean, would you say maybe, I, I wonder, it would be really interesting to know, is the Delta a billion dollars? Is the Delta a hundred million dollars? But what are, what are they paying for the secrecy? Actually, this is a very good idea. They should make a default that everything is revealed. And then even if you have a settlement, they should disclose what is the price that was offered in case everything was transparent. So at least you yeah. know the price they're willing yeah. to pay to keep uh, uh, secret. Yeah. I like our plans to fix the world, Luigi. I think this is a, this is, this is a, this is a good one. <laughs> 
If you're enjoying the discussions Luigi and I are having on this show, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show you should also check out. It's called Big Brains. Big Brains brings you the stories behind the pivotal breakthroughs that are reshaping our world. Change how you see the world and keep up with the latest academic thinking with Big Brains, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. There is one other aspect of this that I've been thinking about David didn't really get at, but that I think is part, part of the problem. And I think that's that's that by the secrecy, the government is often covering up its own role in some of these problems. In other words, it's not that the government is incentivized to have everything come to light and corporate America wants to keep everything secret. And so you have two parties with opposed interests meeting in a, in a neutral court. I think if you look at the opioid crisis, part of that, we can all argue about it what part was the government's fault. I think in the case of the meltdown in the 2008 financial crisis, part of that was the government's fault, the government's fail, fail, failure to regulate, um, and the government's failure to see the collapse of big firms coming, even though they had they had examiners in there. And so some, if you were to be very cynical, you would say the government is also agreeing to these settlements because it covers their own missteps too. I think that's true, but uh, maybe in this particular case, you are too critical with the government because in some cases the government acts in this way because it's bought and paid for the, the person that should represent the government is bought and paid for by a corporation we don't have an abstract the government we have people if corporations are very good at capturing these people maybe by offering future jobs like in the case of uh, the, uh, the Sackler and the opioids we know that uh, the label to legalize the opioids was given by a, a guy at the FDA uh, who a year later worked for Sackler. Is it really fault of the government or is it fault of the private sector that is too aggressive in these activities? It's an yeah, it's an interesting philosophical question. I'm I'm not sure of the answer to that, and I think there is something beyond the government being bought and paid for that is just human beings' desire to like and be liked and get along. It, that is always going to create a degree of regulatory capture, even if you didn't have money at work. And I think that fits into this broader context that we got out a little bit with with David, is that far too often in our society, it seems like the cost of doing the right thing, of having high ethics, just means you get left out of the highest profit potential jobs in this country, and that the cost of being a loyal and good civil servant is now just the dif the differential, again, the delta is just much higher than it was in the 1950s. And I think that to me is deeply sad and problematic. Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Podcast Network and the Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. The show is produced by me, Matt Hodap, and Lita Cesarine, with production assistance from Utsav Gandhi, Sebastian Berka, and Brooke Fox.